Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. We're back into our Bible study in the book of Matthew. Wow, we've been at this for a long time. I've got people who have been going through all these teachings uh, every week, which is just truly amazing. I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for all the encouragement to keep going and spending my time and utilizing my time in these videos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's all about God. It's all about him. I'm just pointing towards him. And um, I pray that you take this wisdom and the knowledge that you gain through these videos and that you go out into the world and you point to him as well. Anyhow, um, enough with that. Let's get onto our Bible study. Let's open up our Bibles. And we're in Matthew, and we're gonna we're in Matthew twenty one. In our last teaching, uh, Messiah had come into the temple uh, for the first time. He came into the temple um, on Palm Sunday, and we talked a lot about his en entry, the donkeys, and and what everything meant. Um, but we also spoke about how the night before he went in on Palm Sunday. He stayed in Bethpage for the first time. He always stayed in Bethany, the home of Ma um, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. But here, he instead stayed in Bethpage. First time it's listed in the Bible that he has done that, which means the house of unripe figs, which represents Israel was not ripe and not ready because Israel is the fig tree. And Messiah, we're going to be talking about this because Messiah is also about to kill a pine, a fig tree. Literally gone. <laughs> so we want to take a look at this and we're going to look at it in detail. Now, the city that he always would stay at was Bethany, which is, which is um, Beth Page's house of unripe figs, not ready for Messiah, not ready for salvation. Israel was not at the time, and um, Bethany is the house of the poor, which is the poor in spirit, the humble, the meek. Um, it's a requirement, a description of believers in Messiah when we look at the Beatitudes. So let's go ahead and, and dig into our scriptures. We're starting today in Matthew 18. Now in the morning, he returned to the city. He was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and nothing, and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said, let no fruit from you grow ever again. Immediately, the fig tree withered away. Let me ask you this. If he's hungry, what is he looking for? He's looking for fruit. What, what fruit? is Messiah looking for? People that have come to him in faith, like a child. We've talked about this. They come to him like a child in faith where they're willing to do what he says and trusting. Is Israel fitting this category? No. Israel is the fig tree. Let's. I know we've done this before, but let's do it again. Let's go to Hosea 9. Verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as first fruits on the, on the fig tree in its first season. But they went to Baalpur and separated themselves to that shame, that they became an abomination like the thing they loved. Israel, the first fruits on the fig tree. Their fathers. Go to, um, give me a second. Sorry about that. I was looking at my notes like, what is that verse doing there? But no, I get it now. Um, go to, to uh, Joel 1, verses 6 and 7. For a nation has come up against my land. What land would God be talking about? Israel. Strong and without number, his teeth are like teeth of a lion, and he has fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste to my vine and ruined my fig tree 
he has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. And that fig tree is Israel, God's land. And we see lion. You've got to wonder. And as Joel's prophesying, Joel's prophesying not long before Babylon, before the Babylonian invasion. A lot of what we see in uh, Joel 1 is kind of looking at Babylon coming, but also looking at the last days. And when I hear lion, I can't help it. We're close. Go to Hosea. Let's just take a look at this real quick. Hosea 5, 14. I'll be like a lion to Ephraim. Ephraim is the northern kingdom. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, sometimes called Joseph, was destroyed by the Assyrians, and they scattered the people all over the place. And they haven't yet to come back. A lion is bigger. It scatters further. Um, and, you know, it shreds to pieces more, scatters things further away than a young lion would. Because then he says, and like, and notice it's God saying that he is doing it. God is the one that sends these destroyers um, because this judgment is meant to bring repentance. And like a young lion to the house of Judah. And Judah was taken off to Babylon, not as far and not as scattered. And they did come back. I even, I will take them away. Excuse me, I will tear them and go away. That's seven, that 70 AD after the temple fell. And I will take them away and no one shall rescue. It's no one except Messiah one day. I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. Returning to their place is Psalm 110. One, his place is sitting next, is in the seat next to the Father. Till they acknowledge their offense. And that's in the tail end of Matthew 23. We're going to get there soon. Where they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they will seek my faith. And in their affliction, in tribulation, they will earnestly seek me. All these things are going to happen, but there will be a time that they come back. And that's important to realize as we go on through the book of, um, in this story about the fig tree in Matthew. So let's go back to Matthew. So Israel is this fig tree. And seeing a fig tree by the road, it came... He came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on to you ever again. See, in Israel, you have to understand the fig trees, they start by producing fruit. The fruit starts growing before the leaves. So this fig tree that's full of leaves but has no fruit is kind of like saying um, that Israel's full of faith, that Israel's good, that Israel's walking in the right way. But the fact that it has no fruit, it's not. It's a contradiction. You know, they're desiring salvation, but they're not ready for it. They are not producing fruit. Now, where else do we see a fig tree that everybody talks about, especially people following prophecy? It's in Matthew 24. I've done videos about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. And, you know, a couple of years ago, I was like, yep, rapture's got to be this year. Fig tree, that generation, 70 years minus seven. You got to look at Psalm 10. It's, no, Psalm 90. And um, guess what? It didn't happen. See, people miss this first verse here. And I did for a long, long time. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. What would happen before that? It would start producing fruit. See, people take the fig tree generation. They start at 1948 when Israel becomes a nation. Was Israel producing fruit in 1948? Not at all. There were no Messianics. There were no Jews for Jesus at that time, so to speak. Today, there are Messianic congregations all over the place. 
And that movement started in the 60s. Where, you know, we had the Jesus movement in the 60s. Well, you had the um, Jesus movement in Israel as well. And it was in 67 that Israel got Jerusalem. You know, you have to wonder, I do, is Israel a nation without Jerusalem, without the city that has God's name on it? Are they a nation without it? I don't think so. But I think in that ballpark is that time for the fig tree generation. Therefore, and it's not that, oh, we've got so much longer to wait to the to the rapture, because when it says about the generation in Psalm 9, let's go look real quick. Go to Psalm 90. What I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is it doesn't mean we have that much further that we have to go, that it's going to be forever until the rapture. No, 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 no. Um, for it is soon cut off. That means you don't go the full distance. The generation gets cut off. You don't go the full gener the distance. The point is that the psalm, um, the fig tree generation is not a constraint that has passed for a pre-tribulation rapture. I've been a little more time with this than I wanted to, but that's okay. Let's go back to Matthew. So what happens to the fig tree? It dies. Immediately the fig tree withers away. Let's keep reading. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did this tr a fig tree wither away so soon? Jesus answered them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you not only, excuse me, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast yourself into this into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will be you will receive. So let's go back to the fig tree. And then we'll talk about throwing mountains around for uh, testing each other's faith. See how much faith you have. See who can throw the mountains the furthest. Okay. Um, this is a verse that many people will use to say that Israel is cut off is gone, will never come back again. And this is a verse that people would use for replacement theology, that the church replaced Israel. And it's always interesting. They go into the Old Testament and they come up with scriptures, and anything that's good, they give to the church. Anything that's bad, they keep over here with Israel, and they try to divide one from the other because obviously Israel is dead. This verse shows it. Um, that's not the rest of the story, though. They didn't read the rest of the story. Do they even know the rest of the story? I don't know. Let's look. So the question is, so God, it, is it true that God got rid of Israel and replaced it with the church? And I would say no. Let's go to Jeremiah 31. And then we're going to start 35 through 37 is where we're going to look at. Thus says the Lord who gives sun, the sun for a light by day. And the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night. Who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel, the seed of Israel, the generations of Israel, shall also cease from being a nation before me, before God. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I also cast all the seed of Israel. I will cast off the seed of Israel. For all they have done, says the Lord. Those ordinances still remain. I mean, I look outside, there's a sun now. Last night, there was a moon and stars. Israel is not cast off from a nation. Not at all. Um, let's look at Ezekiel 37. Nope, not Ezra. Ezra's about the temple. 
Ezekiel 37. Eh. Here we go. Ezekiel. No, I'm not there. I'm sorry. Give me a second. My fingers are fumbling. Ezekiel 37. And we're going to start in verse 1. And the hand of the Lord came upon me uh, and, and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. Did, was he actually in that midst of the valley? No, it was a vision. Um, and I don't want to go through all of this time-wise. Um, then he caused me to pass by them all around. And what's the valley? That'd be the Jezreel Valley. It's known as the Valley of Death. It was their graveyard. It was where they threw all the trash. Um, but anyhow, then he caused me to pass by them all. And behold, there were many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. So there are many bones in this open valley. They're not buried. They're open. And they're very dry. That represents no water, no spirit. This is Israel being cast all over the place without the spirit, lost um, after, the re after what happened when the temple fell. So, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So Ezekiel said with what any good prophet would say, I don't know, I don't know, you know. Oh, Lord God, you know. And again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to come into you and you shall live. What's breath in Hebrew? Ruach. It's breath, it's wind, it's spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Um, four, I will put on sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. This is um, Israel coming to Messiah, coming back to Messiah. But it's a process. It's not going to happen right away. It's a process. It's not... <clears throat> You know, was Israel a godly nation when they came to, in 1948, together? No. Is Israel a godly nation today? Overall, the leadership, do they know Messiah? No. It's not until the middle of tribulation that Israel will be a godly nation. Then it's just a remnant. But God will use that, and he will bring back Israel in an unbelievable way. Um... This process, you you know, I've seen so many people put so many different dates and even saying this is when the sinews were attached, this is when this was. I'm not going to sit and try to do that. I think the process started in 1897 when they had the first Zionist Congress and they started figuring out how, how Israel would be coming back. Um, I want to go down a little bit couple more verses here, um, 21 and 22. Then say to them, says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from the other nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side, from north, south, east, west, and bring them into their own land, Israel. I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, with one king, shall be king over them, and they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. So not only is Judea coming back, but Israel is coming back. Ephraim is coming back. That northern nation, the northern Israel, that hasn't been, that was dispersed in 722 BC and has not come back yet, they will. Not people to say that they're lost. Nobody knows. God knows where they are. One king over them. Go to John 14, is it? Or is it John 10? 10, maybe? Give me a second here. 
Yeah, John 10. Verse 16. And I have other sheep which are not in this fold. And he's talking to the disciples. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. And Messiah is that good shepherd. He is that king that will be reigning in the midst of the children of Israel forever, sitting on the throne of David. So, who are the sheep he's talking to, and who are the other sheep that he needs to go get and bring into this fold? The existing fold is Israel. The other sheep are the Gentiles. We are grafted in. We are the wild branch grafted into an olive tree. Israel is not grafted into the church. The church is grafted into Israel. I think a lot of Christians um, forget that. Let's go back to it to Ezekiel, and we want to look at 24 and 25. David, my servant, will be king over them. That's Messiah. And they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in my land that I have given to Jacob, my children, where their father dwelled, and they shall dwell there. They, their children, their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. David representing Messiah, because Messiah will reign on the throne of David forever. Wow. Um, let's go back to Matthew. Oh, what's interesting? Actually, let's, we're in Ezekiel 37. Let's go to Ezekiel 38. There's a day that Israel will come to Messiah, and that's what Ezekiel 37 is talking about. Ezekiel 38 is Gog and Magog, and we see the purpose of it. It's thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know that I am God. I don't think it's a coincidence that God has this and Ezekiel 37 has this passage about Israel coming back together and being formed and saying that they will, there will be a day that there will be one nation of Israel and God will be the king, excuse me, Messiah will be the king over them. And then you see Gog and Magog coming in the next chapter because Gog and Magog is the time that Israel is going to say, oh my goodness, we missed it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now let's go back to Matthew. So, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did this fig tree wither away so soon? And Jesus answered them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only be able to do what was done to the fig tree, but you will also be able to say to this mountain, be removed and cast yourself into the sea, and it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Um, so is Jesus like, um, how do I word it? We're in, the Olympics are going on, Summer Olympics, yes. No, I'm not watching, though. My, I have my reasons, and you guys probably understand. But anyhow, is Messiah saying that we should add mountain throwing to the Olympics and see who has, what country has the greatest faith? Should we go out and just throwing mountains around for fun? Eh, you know what? The Rockies are cool over there, but I think the Rockies would be better over here. No. This mountain. It's a definite article. It's not a mountain. It's not any mountain. It is this mountain. It is the Temple Mount. The sea is the Gentiles. This is about taking Messiah to the Gentiles. And that's what the disciples will be doing. It's about sharing Messiah. Um, we see this throughout some places, but let's go to Daniel. Daniel. 
Yeah, let's go to Daniel. Daniel 2. And I could teach some piece about Daniel 2. I'm not going to do it. We're going to try to skim through this one. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Comes to all the seers, the prophets, all these wise men, and says, hey, okay, guys, interpret this dream. They said, great, tell us the dream. He says, no, no, I'm not going to tell you the dream so you can lie to me. Um, I want you to tell me what the dream is and what the interpretation is. And if you don't do that, I'm just going to wipe you all off and kill you all off because you're not really, you know, seers or being able to see in the future. And Daniel says, wait, my God can do this. I got this guy. I know this guy. He can do this. I hope you know that guy too. But anyhow, let's look at a, a couple of scriptures here in Daniel. Ah. I get distracted. I get my paper Bible out, and I forget that I'm not using it. I'm doing it here. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel 2. 20 and 21. Daniel Anderson said, um, give me a second. No, 20, that's not it. We're, we're here. It's 32 and 33 I want. Those are the, the verses in Matthew. So the, this statue, he sees this statue. The image's head was fine gold. What is that? That's Babylon. Its chest and arms are silver. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. And its belly and thighs are bronze. That's Greece. And its legs, iron. That's Rome. And you could say that the feet and the toes are part of the legs, and it goes from there on. Or, hmm, you could also say that this is the seventh kingdom and the eighth that comes out of the seventh. What are you talking about? Let's go back to... And this is what I believe it is. And we'll talk about this more probably, I don't know if it's Matthew 24, when we get into Revelation, we'll do this. But Revelation 17, and we want to go down to 9 and 10. Here is a mind, it's about a beast with seven heads and ten hills. Seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads are seven mountains. Mountains are kingdoms on which the woman sits. The woman is pagan idolatry, a false religion. There, there are also there are there are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue for a short while. So, what's the one that is Rome? So you have a you have a seventh kingdom, one that comes after Rome. The five that were, most likely, Egypt, Assyria, um, Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire, Greece. That these five were before Rome. These are kingdoms that had dominion over Israel. The next one, I believe, is Great Britain, United States. I'm not going to explain why here. We'll talk about it later. Um, and that would be the seventh. That and so five kings, five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when it comes, it must remain, continue for a short time. And then it talks about an eighth kingdom. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which have yet to receive a kingdom as yet. But they will receive their authority for one hour, one hour tribulation, as kings with the beast, with the Antichrist, okay? Um, you ever look in the New World Order, One World Government, go back and look at what they plan to do. They're going to break up the world into ten regional governments. The beast that was is, not him, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seventh, is but is going to perdition. So he's going to come out of the seventh, and that's going to be the eighth is the Antichrist kingdom. That's the way I see it. And I know that I could teach forever on this, but we're in Matthew, so let's get back to Matthew. 
hopefully that was a little bit understandable. Um, let me throw this out. Revelation, in Reve if, if you want more information about that, look at this. Revelation 13. The beast has the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. Okay, those are the three first three beasts in Daniel 7. Um, it's those three beasts in Daniel 7 coming together for the Antichrist kingdom. Okay. The mouth is the one in charge. You look up, look at the mouth. The mouth uh, is a lion. It's a lion with wings like the eagle. Lion, Great Britain. Eagle, United States. The United States is the daughter of Great Britain, the daughter of Babylon. The wings get ripped off. The United States is destroyed. And the lion is lifted up and given the heart of a man. There's your Antichrist coming out of Great Britain. All right. More than I should have done. I didn't want to go that far, but I did. Oh, well. So, where are we headed next to? Back to Matthew. The rock. Hmm. So what is this mountain that's being thrown? Give me a second here. But you will say to the, the, the mountain being moved. We gotta need to go back to this rock. We need to go back to Daniel. I know I was getting a little off track. Got me sidetracked. This mountain that's being thrown. Daniel 2. And let's find the, the mountain that's thrown. We're just going to pick up at 34. You watched while a stone was cut without human hands. God's involved. Which struck the image at its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, all of it, all these pagan empires throughout history, all represented here. Kind of means that they have to exist today, do they? Um, yeah. Babylon, Iraq, Medo-Persia Empire, Iran, Greece, Greece, uh, Babylon could be could actually be Iran. Um, no, I'll take that back. Babylon, Iraq, Medo Persia, Iran, um, Greece, Greece, Rome, Rome. But they all get destroyed, wiped away, nothing left. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff. A little draw after the harvesting the field from the summer threshing floor the wind carried them away and there was no trace left to be found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain a great kingdom and filled the whole earth so all the pagan empires are gone who is the stone let's find it in scripture let's not guess Although I, I think you, you, you probably have guessed, and you probably had a really good guess, but let's see it in Genesis 49. <laughs> this is Jacob talking to his 12 children, the elders of Israel. And this is prophetic. This is prophecy. How do you know? Well, just read verse 1. And Jacob called his sons together called his sons and said, Gather together, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. And that's not quite last days. It's the end of days. It's the last day. The last se the seventh day, the last thousand years, starting with the rapture and tribulation. So let's go down to Genesis 49, verse 24. Um, let's go back up further. We'll start at 22 for context. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by the wall. His branch runneth over the wall, or branches run over the wall. 
His archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But the bow remains in strength. And the arms of his hand were made strong, but the hands of the mighty God by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Notice how shepherd and stone are capitalized? They're Messiah. Messiah is that rock that gets thrown. So what does this mean for you and me today? And we need to be sharing Messiah. We need to be talking to people about him. Because that's how we throw a stone, we throw Messiah, into the sea, into the Gentile world. And walls come tumbling down as people come to faith. This is our job. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Let's go back to Matthew. Twenty-one, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. I think people take this to say, I want to win the lottery. I believe it. It doesn't work that way. Um, the, the, the context here is sharing Messiah with people. Um, Go to 1 John, 1 John. Five fourteen. Now this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask according to, according to his will, he hears us. See, if we're in Messiah and Messiah is in us, we're not going to be asking for things that are outside of his will. Um, sometimes you're going to hear yes, no. Sometimes it's quiet, wait. But if we're truly believers, we're not asking for things that are outside his will. And people take these passages, if two are gathered together, two or three are gathered together and they ask anything of me, it'll be done. It's got to be in his will. Um, all right, let's keep moving on. See how far we, yeah, we're almost done with what we're going to do here today. So let's go back to Matthew. Take a look at verse 23 with me. And when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people, that'd be the Sanhedrin, the leadership. So give me one second. And when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him. And he was te as he was teaching, saying, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And from the times of Aaron, priests, prophets, they would lay hands on each other and pass that authority down. I understand they're questioning him. Where does your authority come from? We know where our authority comes from, but you're doing some things out there. Where does your authority come from? As we continue in math in this in Matthew 21, we're going to see more and more everybody coming to question him, to interrogate him, to see if the Passover lamb, Messiah, has any blemishes, any faults. And they're not going to find any. Sorry, I ruined the story. And we'll follow up here next week. Thank you very much for watching. May God bless you.